Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Chandel Hoover, Science Programs Officer at the American Psychological Association. Thank you for joining us today, and please let us know where you're from by saying hello in the chat. Today's program is the second session of Becoming a Psychological Scientist, a six-part webinar series about navigating the application process for doctoral programs in psychological science. For each session, we'll post a short video about an important step in the application process, and then we'll host a panel discussion a few days later in which experts in the field and current graduate students will offer advice, share their experiences, and answer your questions. Applying to graduate school can be challenging and deeply personal, but it's worth the effort. And we hope our time together brings you closer to success. Today's topic, writing a compelling application statement, will offer tips and strategies for writing a statement that makes a strong case for admission to grad school. Before we get started, I want to share a few quick announcements. First, many thanks to those who submitted questions for today's program. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. You can also ask a question during the program using the Q&A feature on your dashboard, and we'll add them to our list. Also, this program is being recorded. Everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording in about two weeks. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dr. Adrian Stith Butler, Deputy Chief for the APA Science Directorate. Thank you so much, Shandal, and welcome everyone today to uh, the next installment in our uh, series and a warm welcome to our panelists today. Uh, I'm going to be serving as the moderator um, and we'll first uh, field some questions that were um, provided um, in advance and then we will go to live audience questions. Uh, and first I will introduce our panelists and then we will get right to it. Um, let's see, first we have Haley Brooks, who is a six year, uh, thank you for the wait, um, PhD student at the University of Denver. Her research combines behavior, psychophysiology, neuroimaging and computational modeling to understand and characterize how temporal context influences risky monetary decision-making. Uh, she works in many places, but uh, she works also in the lab of Dr. Peter Sokol Hessner, who is also here today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, and uh, she leads the editor group for the Application Statement Feedback Program, or um, AFSP, which supports psychology PhD applicants from across the globe who identify as first generation, underrepresented, or as someone without access to PhD informed mentorship. And uh, the editor group provides high level and fast uh, paced feedback on applications. Uh, we also have Becky Suzuki, who is a third year doctoral trainee, trainee in clinical psychology um, in the uh, traumatic stress studies group at the University of Denver. She is a community engaged researcher uh, who's interested in improving access to and quality of services for survivors of gender based violence. Uh, Becky taught English um, as a Fulbright Scholar in Germany and served with AmeriCorps. Um, and she worked as a research assistant studying anxiety, trauma, and grief um, at NYU School of Medicine. And Becky also helps to run uh, ASFP. Um, next we have Dr. Natasha Cabrera, uh, who is Professor of Human Development at the University of Maryland. Her research focuses on father involvement and children's social and cognitive development, adaptive and maladaptive uh, factors related to parenting and cultural variation in ethnic minority families, and the mechanisms linking uh, early experiences to children's uh, school readiness. Uh, she's an associate editor of Child Development and is a is co PI at the National Center of Research on Hispanic Families and Children, co directing the Fatherhood and Healthy Marriage Focus Area. And Dr. Peter Sokol Hessner is associate professor at Denver University. Um, in his work, he integrates the perspectives and methods associated with different fields, including cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience, uh, behavioral and microeconomics to understand how we assess value, uh, how we use value to guide behavior and ways uh, that emotion is integrated into those processes. Um, and uh, Peter founded the professional development program called Paths in Psychological Science within the psychology department at Denver University. Uh, he's an academic advisor for uh, psychology undergraduates and was the department's professional development coordinator for 20, uh, 2020 to 2022. 
uh, and he founded and leads uh, ASFB. So welcome to you all. So I'm going to, um, let's see, I will throw the first question to Natasha. Um, and it's a big one, okay. Uh, what should be the primary focus of my statement of per uh, purpose? Uh, should it be more focused on passion or experience? Oh my goodness, that's not a hard one. You gave me the hard <laughs> one. Uh. <laughs> no easy ones here. No, um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think, um, when I often talk about my work, I get really passionate about it. I think that can engage people. So I think um, if you have experiences that are related to your passion, maybe begin there. Um, um, I think, you know, it's not even, I mean, in the, all the years that I've been doing this, it's not even what's the right way to approach is It's very unique to each person, but how authentic, how real I can can I see a person in this statement um sometimes you know students will begin with a personal story and I completely connect to it uh because they've taken me in this journey all the way to uh, apply for graduate school so I'm going yes and come into my lab and you know um so I think it really it, it really is about storytelling in a way and how you your past experiences you are a whole person everything that you, you've done or are doing makes you as a person and you bring that to graduate school. I think those are assets. And if you can tell us a story or how you got here and how the research or the graduate experience will enhance you as a person, as a professional, I think it's always nice to see. Um, and I appreciate I appreciate that uh, a lot because I think all of us have, you know, different journeys and I and all of us have different ways to understand our experiences and the more you make sense of them and the more you see yourself situated in a place, I think I think, oh yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Come, come to us. Thank you. So it sounds like it's not passion or experience, but you're sort of infusing both um, as you as you tell a story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering from, so um, uh, Becky and Hilly, you're both um, currently uh, graduate students. And so I'm wondering if you have a thought about that, that very question. Maybe I'll ask Haley. So I think I would just add on um, to what Natasha said that it's going to be a little bit of both, but I think that one thing about um, going to grad school is like your passion might change a little bit. So it's okay as you're writing the statements that if you're if you're demonstrating that you're interested at some broad level in this topic, that 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 PI is um, is working in, and that's really good. But then backing up the experience that even if maybe you don't have um, experience in that specific topic. Um, or you don't have a lot to show in the ways of how you're passionate about it, you can at least use your experiences to back you up and say, like, I am capable of um, pursuing this area of interest. And so um, I think relying on your experiences are also really important to demonstrate that, that you're ready to take on this really big um, endeavor. Thank you. Um, let's see, here is another, what, um, and this is a question for Becky, uh, what are some topics or uh, just general mistakes to avoid when writing your application essay that might not seem obvious? Yeah, I think it's really difficult because there are so many things that you're trying to balance in writing a statement, right? You're trying to show that passion, you're trying to show your um, you know, experiences and how they've kind of led you to this place of uh, applying to this person, to this school. And so you're trying to balance a lot of things. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it's really important to focus on like not regurgitating your CV. You know, there are so many things that you've done in your lives that are really relevant and important. Um, but being really reflective and thoughtful about the parts of your experiences that are particularly relevant to the questions that you're interested in ans answering or asking throughout grad school is going to be more important than saying, you know, like I did 14 projects and I did like my, you know, I worked in XYZ thing on multiple projects in this way and, and, and kind of getting out of those like small details and remembering that your statement is about who you are and who you want to be as a scientist and using those experiences 
to kind of draw a picture, so to speak, for your uh, potential PI or um, committee that for the place that you're applying to. So I think, you know, making sure that you're really reflective and trying to draw that picture and in that story is is really important to kind of remembering. And remember, you don't have to do every single thing. You don't have to write every single thing. No one is, uh, you know, gonna like fact check every single little thing that you say, but it's rather about creating that story. If I could just back that up really briefly, um, one thing that I think Becky said, which is just so true, is that your statement has a goal. It's trying to convince people that you are ready for your PhD, that you'll succeed in your PhD, and that this place is the place to do your uh, your advanced training, right? Um, and so the answer, you know, what shouldn't you cover? If it's not advancing that argument, it's probably not the place for it. Um, there may be other ways to address it. So you want to remember your statement is one piece. So the, you also have letters of recommendation. You can talk to your recommenders and say, hey, I would really love it if you'd be able to maybe cover this thing or emphasize this aspect of me or my training or my experience. Um, you also have a CV. So if your statement is too much of a CV, you're, you're just submitting two of the same thing, one that's formatted like a CV and one that's formatted like a statement. That's not making the strongest case. So you want to make sure that you're picking things to write about that establish what the application statement can uniquely do, which is exactly this blend of passion and experience and this path, this sense of how you've gotten to here and what that means about the kind of scientist and PhD student you'll be. Um, so I'm going to ask a, another a question that is related to that and has got a little sort of uh, sort of different angle to it. Um, and so the question is, how do I make my personal statement not just a regurgitation of my CV when I don't have a very compelling like why story to tell? Um, anyone had a thought about that? I mean, I, I kind of would push back on that and, and mm -hmm. say, you probably do. You probably do actually have a why side story. Um, no, not everyone has to have like a, you can't, you don't necessarily have to have a crystallized reason of why you want to do this, right? But you probably do. And so, you know, kind of, I don't know, uh, anyone feel free to jump in, but I, I would say something that kind of helps me is to think through like, why do I actually want, why do I want to do this? Like what, what sparks my passion for this? And then what comes to mind? Um, and then yeah. start there with that concrete thing and move from there for a why psych story, because there probably is something. Right. I, I agree. I'm going to agree with Becky. I think everybody has a compelling story. It's really how good a storyteller you are. <laughs> Don't under, undermine your life. You got here. You are an interesting person. You like yourself, all those things. Um, make us, you know, make us feel that. I, I think, um, you know, we're people, people reading this dissertation, these papers, uh, this statement are, are people just like anybody else. So if we get excited about someone's interesting path or, or curious, I, I myself appreciate curiosity. And sometimes students will say, you know, I did this and I don't know why it's completely unrelated. And I go, oh my God, that makes you so interesting. That's fascinating. Actually, any experience that you've had uh, can really, you can draw some lessons for it, from it, for everything. So, um, yeah, telling, uh, the why the, you know, kind of like why this school, why me, why this program, um, like Becky was saying, allows you also a little bit of self-reflection. Those are probably good things to ask anyways. Um, can you envision yourself with this person, with this program for five years or and why would you want to do that? So, yeah. And that should be a good questions to ask, no matter what. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and something that just popped up, there are a lot of questions um, about this, and then I'm gonna then I'll move to another topic. Um, about um, sort of weaving a story when um, especially in research programs who want to see your skill set and sort of giving specific examples and sort of how to how to sort of craft uh, the personal statement when you're trying to get those things in. So 
One of the things that I would recommend is thinking about what you're not able to tell with your CV. So you can list your experiences, but you can't really provide a whole lot of detail um, about those experiences. So you can't really provide in your CV what you learned. Um, mm -hmm. Any maybe, you know, maybe wouldn't phrase it as like mistakes made, but how did you grow as a scientist and a person from those experiences? And how does that prepare you? Um, for this next step. So those are things that you can't mention in your CV, but the personal statement allows you to kind of personalize the things that you're listing and kind of tell a story. So maybe you'll do chronological order or maybe we'll break it up into themes um, and, and show the reader how you got there. Um, yeah, I think that's, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, if I may, just one little thing. I feel like people often feel like they need to have a very linear story when they're writing these statements. Like they they have a picture in their head that this should be this story that's full of amazing research experiences, all of which look like the research experience they hope to get as a PhD student. You're applying to be a PhD student. You are not one yet. It's okay that the experiences are not an ideal fit. That's almost expected. And a, a positive spin on that is a way to say, I've tried other things and I learned during that, that yeah. some of that wasn't for me and I learned what was. That can be part of making a case for your, your maturity and the fact that you're making a very informed choice. When you say, I'm committed to this and I want to do this and I'm deeply excited about it, that comes from a place of knowledge. You didn't just decide that, that's something that you figured out over a whole bunch of different experiences, some of which may be kind of off the mark um, of, of where you hope to go eventually. So don't, don't expect yourself to have a linear story very, very few stories are linear, and often some of the most interesting ones and the deepest motivating ones are the ones that aren't linear, the ones that took a left turn, that had a change, that had challenges. Those were all learning opportunities. Um, so don't, don't try to expect yourself to write some beautiful, totally linear uh, story. Be honest about where you've been and what you've learned uh, and how that has shaped the very informed choice you're making now. Yeah, I, I agree. Just to uh, chime in uh, quickly. Um, it's not, you know, I, I tend to think giving my own children that sometimes taking the scenic route is more interesting. <laughs> it may take you longer. <laughs> you, those detours that uh, Peter was talking about. I mean, that's when you, science is also discovered in those detours. <laughs> so um, just allow yourself to be curious. I mean, I think if, if I were to be asked what's the most important or you know, one of the most important skills or characteristics, I, I would say curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, being curious is really a nice thing. It allows you to grow and to learn, to make mistakes, to move, to be committed to, I mean, all the things that we want you to do um, in graduate school, and then to have a personal investment in the growth for you as a person, but also as a professional. So I, I think it's fantastic once you have that curiosity, but it's really hard if you're not curious, then everything's a chore. If you don't, you know, then it's long. And then, you know, I, I always know when I'm not interested, it's like, why is this taking 20 years when it's only been two seconds? It feels forever. So uh, curiosity does really make, you know, allows you to play and to try and experiment and explore and basically to do science in that way. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so here's a question. Um, Natasha, I'm gonna pose this to you. Um, are there any pieces of advice for learning how to keep the essay relatively short? Ah, uh, yes. Writing, you know, I had, yes, I do have something to say about this. <laughs> my graduate, my mentor, a long, long time ago, I'm from Canada, he uh, sat down with me and he basically said, I have too many words and I'm saying nothing. <laughs> so that I should be more, economical with my words, be precise, take my time, say what I mean, not because I thought, you know, to sound smart, I had to use a lot of long words and say a lot. And simplicity, it really is. He's right. Simplicity is just so hard to achieve and so important. Be simple, be to the point, be direct. I don't think you need, um, you know, you need to sound obscure or, you know, 
complicated. I mean, just what you, you know, crisp, beautiful sentences. If you like to read fiction, I would suggest read a fiction book before you write your personal statement. You'll be totally inspired by how beautiful language comes to writers. And so I, I try to get inspired by those people and say, I just want to write those beautiful, crisp sentences that, you know, get put together in a short three or four pages and don't say a lot and say a lot at the same time. So I, I would go for simple and for crisp and not too many words, but succinct. Wonderful, thank you. Um, any other comments actually before I maybe move on? You all play off each other very nicely. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that was such a great way of putting it, um, Natasha, but I was thinking also like sometimes it's really great to just say the thing, just just write it down, just actually say it instead of writing around it or trying to find those words and make it sound so like eloquent and articulate because we tend to do a lot of like writing around the thing instead of actually just saying like, I want to do this because of X, Y, Z thing. And when you actually write it down and it doesn't sound very pretty, then you can make it sound better later. But often we can say things in way less words than we actually say it because we think it has to sound a certain way so just yeah that's usually what I tend to do is just just like actually make myself write it down first and then make it sound better later great very good advice um let's see here's a question for Haley um for applicants whose research experience is varied, um, how can they best communicate their desire to focus on one topic? So I think a lot of this actually relates to what Peter has already said to some extent that um, you can think of this as a feature and it's not a bug to your application statement. It's something that um, you can show as a positive. So you can show you've tried cognitive psychology and social psychology, but now you're interested in something that's more clinical. Um, and you can, you can talk about your previous experiences as what you learned. So maybe if you were in a cognitive lab, you learned um, something about the way that cognition is happening. And that made you wonder if, um, what's, what's that like when people are interacting with each other? So I went to a social lab where I got some experience doing this. And then I was thinking, you know, what happens when something like this goes wrong or, you know, is uh, connected with things like depression or so that made me um, that's what's kind of led me here to want to take the clinical route and, and try to figure out not only the research behind it, but how I can apply this and help people. So you can connect those things in ways that maybe you're, you're not seeing right now, but if you can try to make a connection between each of those um, areas. It doesn't necessarily have to be very smooth, but you you made the jump. So why did you make the jump? There's There's got to be a reason. And so you can talk about what that reason is, and you might find that you're able to connect that much better um, than you think. And then also relying on the tools that you learned, the methodologies that you used, and how that's going to set you up for success to focus in on whatever research question you're interested in right now. Thank you, Haley. Um, so here is um, a question um, about uh, master's applications. So um, for, for example, a master's application in counseling psychology, uh, should you still base personal statements around research? Um. I guess I can answer as a, a clinical uh, person. I mean, here's the thing, like, I don't know. Uh, honestly, like, I think that, you know, it depends on the type of program. I think that the program will tell you what it wants, right? So there's so many clinical programs, clinical work programs out there, whether that's social work or counseling or, you know, this is, you know, doctoral student being a PhD student or being a PhD in clinical psychology is going to be most of the time research focused. A master's in counseling, if that's going to get you a license, if that's going to be something, you know, where you're going to practice in the future, then it may be a totally different 
type of application. Um, and, you know, we, we probably aren't um, necessarily like the best people to answer that question, but I think the best way to do, the best thing to do would be to like go to the website of the program and see what they see what they say about themselves. Like, do they want researchers? Are you applying to one person? Um, and then change your statement accordingly. That's good ab advice. I agree with that. I think some, you know, I know some counseling um, colleagues who are very much into research. And so they probably would want, um, you know, someone who has the experience or background or interest um, but I also would just say research is a good thing, um, you know, no matter what, even if you don't be, want to become a researcher. I mean, those skills of learning, exploring, understanding, synthesizing information, knowing where to find it, how to vet information that's, you know, not, I don't know, credible from credible, um, you know, I think those are important skills. Even if you're not a researcher and you're a clinic, uh, clinician, for example, how would you, you know, learn information to pass it on to your students or to shape your practice? So I think, you know, having those research skills are really important for anyone. We lived in a, in a world that, oh my goodness, I don't know about you guys, but I can't keep up with all this reading and all this. <laughs> it's just so much every minute of the day. How do you vet what you should read and ignore? And so I think the more literate we are about you know research skills i think that better for any job and you'll be more you'll probably also be more attractive as a counselor i mean imagine going to your doctor and saying i don't know any research skills I, you know i went to graduate school or to medical school in 1901 and i haven't you know read any research you go <gasps> so you want to keep up with the research so you want your skills so you can translate them into your science into your clinical practice Yeah, I'll, I'll note that this is also a version of this question applies to even just applying to clinical psychology programs themselves, let alone a master's in counseling, um, as I'm sure Becky would mm -hmm. be able to speak much better than me. But even among clinical psychology PhD programs, this variability in the relative balance between clinical work and research. Yeah. And so this question is, is actually quite big. Um, and ultimately, I, I think uh, Natasha's right that you want to look at what these people are doing. What does the program tell you? So when they describe themselves, how do they describe themselves? And what are the people you're applying to, to work with and learn from? What do they seem to do? When, you know, at, at the very least, you could always ask, you could always ask, to what extent does this program balance research and uh, clinical training? And the answer might be very informative and might help you understand, okay, here's how I can best situate myself to help them understand what I would be like in that setting. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, here's a question I'm going to pose to uh, Becky. Um, at what level does personal experience become off-putting in an essay? When does it simply just sound overboard? Yeah, that's a big one. That's a really big question. And there's a lot of different answers to it. And it really, um, I think you'll hear lots of different answers to it as well. Um, for at ASFP, the way that we've kind of um, thought about this is sort of giving applicants the pros and cons of doing it, right? We, uh, especially if you are someone coming from a minoritized background, um, we need your experiences and your lived experiences in the field and they make the field a lot better. Um, that being whether that be racial minoritized uh, experiences or um, mental health experiences, whatever that is, it's really, really important for us to have. And at the same time, it's also true that especially in clinical programs, often there are on the back end, like people that will not even uh, entertain applicants that talk about their personal lived experiences. Um, especially to like a, um, a to like a, a large degree. And so I think that it's kind of a yes and like, yes, it's important to talk about, especially if it feels like it's really relevant to the questions that you want to answer. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in depression and anxiety and you're someone who's dealt with depression and anxiety, that that's interesting and helpful. And, you know, you don't want to sit and 
talk about that so much that it becomes like the point of your essay, right? The idea is to take that, take your experiences and then also uh, reflect on how they kind of uh, tie to the larger picture that you're trying to, the larger thing that you're trying to say, right? I wrote about personal experiences in my essay because it was really important to me as, you know, a researcher and, uh, you know, as uh, in terms of the things that I was interested in, they started from a place of like our, my personal experiences, but instead of, you know, spending a lot of time there, starting with that and then moving forward to kind of like tie that really uh, into sort of your larger argument and, and, and really think through the pros and cons of talking about it, I think are really important, right? I think it's, I think it's easy for me to be like, yeah, talk about it or no, don't talk about it. But like, it's not that simple. Um, and there are, the reality is that like, there may be everyone on this panel may have completely different ways of thinking about it. Um, and um, so I think that you should, the end is of what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, there are, there are pros to it and there are cons to it. And you need to think through exactly what is it serving your, per is it serving your purpose and your larger goals to talk at length about any personal experiences that um, and how they're related to your larger goals. Um, I don't know if that was super articulate, but that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and Peter, I'm sure, or anyone, feel free to jump in with more. Yeah, that was really helpful. And and actually there's a related question, um, super related that uh, maybe I'll um, pose to uh, Natasha. Um, it was a specific question about um, talking about overcoming uh, a mental health um, struggle um, in the essay. So, um, Rebecca, you definitely um, sort of spoke to some of that. I'm wondering if, Natasha, there are other things that you would uh, say about that. Yeah, no, uh, Becky, very articulate. I really appreciated your answer. Um, you know, I, I was as you were talking, I was thinking of the story of uh, um, I have a colleague of mine who's a cardiologist and I said, so why did you become a cardiologist and not a, you know, gallbladder person? I don't know why, why specifically a heart. And so he told me the story. It was so interesting. It went back to when third grade with his teacher who had a heart attack, the teacher that he loved. And anyway, so, so I was thinking, this is so compelling. You know, he made it a life out of the story, out of the personal experience. So I think those are really important. I always wanna know why you chose this and not the other. I think it tells a lot about the person you are, the interest you're in, um, your passion or your commitment to, the, to that issue. Um, so I love personal stories myself. Um, you know, of course, if you're just gonna talk about, you know, the third grade teacher for like five pages, maybe that's not good, but um, you know, often these stories are, gives us a window into your personality, your soul, your who you are more so than other things. So I will let the story tell itself. And um, and then, you know, because you're telling that story, um, I'm sure that you're reflective about it. You know what made you, you know, tell this story and not the 20 million other stories that you have in your life. So that in itself is a really nice way to get to know you. So I, I love personal stories. Oh, and the question specifically, um, sorry, Adrian, it was about overcoming mental health mm -hmm. issues. I mean, those are also important. Um, you have an insight into how dark these places things can be for yourself and have incredible amount of empathy for yourself or other people. Um, I think those are really in the struggles that we all have and you know whether we can overcome them in whatever timeline. And I, I think those are, again, part of your story. And this is who... Um, who you are and who you bring to the table. I think it's really important to to make that part of who you are, but not, you know, or, I mean, we all have adversities. I try to think that the pathologists of everyday life, we all live with something. Um, and um, and so just, yeah, just telling who you are in a whole package is probably a, a good thing. Yeah, I think I, my one sort of addition there would be that your guiding principle is always, is this making a case for me as a PhD student? If it is, then there's an argument for potentially including it. If it's not, it can still be important to you and it can still be a big part of who you are and part of your life and something that you're not denying or turning away. You're just saying, it's not advancing that argument that I need to make right now in this statement. Um, and it's okay if you end up deciding that about some things having to do with your lived experience. That's an okay way to do it. 
as well as to evaluate what you are choosing to include. Is it making that argument? Can I help it make that argument better? Can I focus it a little more? I might not need to provide all the details. Can I make that case a little quicker or more directly and so on? Um, with clinical programs, what can happen is that people treat the statement like something you would tell a, a potential client. They treat the statement mm -hmm. like something you would share relatively publicly. Um, and so self-disclosing in that kind of context as a clinician isn't always a good idea. Um, and so that's why, that's part of why some people will see that in a statement and say, nope, that's not, that's not okay. I'm not, I'm not going to consider this application any further. Oh. Regardless of how we feel about it, which is that we think this is important, this is part of your lived experience, we do not want a further stigma around mental health in mental health providers. Never, absolutely not. That is how some people out there are doing this. Um, and so that's worth mm. knowing. And that's part of making this cost benefit analysis for yourself um, and, and understanding what these folks might be looking for. So we're certainly not advocating it, but in, sort of, in terms of trying to help you understand your application process, that's some of the truth that you might encounter out there. So maybe Peter, just to, uh, to pick back on that, not just tell a story, but how you tell the story and what you choose to write. Um, and what you choose to make exactly to share of yourself. Yeah. I think we all have private sauce and we don't have to share everything all the time. I, I agree. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see, here's a question um, that's uh, come in recently about um, how, let's see, how can an applicant use their essay to bolster their application if other aspects of it um, are not as it like? So for example, the you know grades, um, test scores aren't, aren't what you hoped. How can you use the essay to sort of, sort of couch that or supplement it or um, mention it, not mention it? That's a good question. <laughs> the elephant yeah. in the room. Do you just pretend that you didn't get the C and that nobody right. right. <laughs> or, or do you, do you <laughs> talk about that in the story of sort of how you've come to the place you are? I, I, I right. I um, you know, I was just talking about this with a student of mine that how in general with students we're just don't like to get bad grades. We think that's a terrible indictment on our character and our knowledge. But in the back in the day. I don't know, Peter, how old you are, but I'm back in the day. <laughs> My professor will say to me, How are you, how are you gonna know that you that you don't know if you don't get a bad grade? I mean, how are you gonna learn? Where is the learn, you know? So kind of seeing the growth and the opportunity for, I mean, a lot of business people also, people who are business gurus will tell you, you, you don't make any, you don't get anywhere unless you make a mistake. Your mistakes are where you learn. Mistakes are actually the ingredients for growth and learning. So um, I don't know. I think you, you know, there's a way to, to appreciate one's experiences without jeopardizing our life, but making account that, that uh, I, I want to know how, not so much what mistakes you made, but how did you learn from them? And, um, you know, and what and how whether that contributed to something unique or interesting about you and your approach to it. So growth is, I think, important and a, and a good thing too. And admit that you kind of made a mistake. That's okay too. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, this is this can be absolutely part of that growth story. Um, absolutely part of your saying. You know, this was a moment where I realized or I learned. Or here's how I turned things around. Um, and so in that respect, it, there could be absolutely nothing wrong with a bad grade um, or any other kind of negative experience um, that you have where you took a job or a position or you joined a lab and it ended up not going how you wanted to. Maybe that informs the things that you're looking for and why you're choosing the current lab you're choosing, right? Or the current PI program. Um, and that's part of why you value it so much. So that can be turned into a strength. I will also, I know we're talking about the application statement. This is also the kind of thing that sometimes letters can help with. So you can ask letter writers to help you handle some of your weaknesses. Uh, and that's a little more indirect. Uh, and so it can sometimes be easier for a letter writer to do that than for you to do that. You want them to do it in close collaboration with you so that they say what you're hoping to communicate in some way. Um, but that, that can be a way to address this where you say, I'm gonna focus on other stuff in my statement, but listen, letter writer number one, 
I've got this one week spot. Can you help people maybe understand or contextualize that or, or help them see the positive side of that in your letter? Um, and that's a, that's a great place for, for some of those things. Yeah, I agree. If I could just uh, quickly add uh, here. Um, also, in addition to the bad stuff that you might need to explain or contextualize why that contributed, um, also understand um, omissions, you know, sense of omission. Like why, for example, in our department, we make a lot of, uh, we put a lot of emphasis in research experience. And if so, an applicant doesn't have a lot of research opportunities, we go, hmm, what happened? Do you know where you're getting into all these things? So I think explaining why you don't have publications or whatever, research presentations or whatever you want to do, um, it's also a good thing, especially if you read online that the department is heavily, you know, if they do a lot of research, like we were saying earlier, then by all means explain why you don't have the research um, experience that they might be looking for because they want to see that you fit to their requirements. Um, and often these stories, I, I mean, again, it's, a, it's your story. <laughs> you know, I had a young, we had a young applicant a long time ago who applied and she said she was, you know, she had to walk like or take a bus, I don't know, for an hour to the next town so she can have, you know, be part of a lab and do her research experience. So it explains why her research um, was limited, but she did these other things to compensate it. So I thought, wow, she's so resilient. <laughs> Give her a hundred for resilient. So, you know, um, th the lack of, of research experience was really not that important when I saw how resourceful she was. So, so that those are things important to make sure that you your skills, even in the negative things, but also what you don't have match uh, or explain why you don't have what the, what the university wants you to have. Thank you. Um, Let's say here is another question. Uh, what are your tips for connecting my research to showcase that it aligns with the professor I want to work with? Um, like if they've got a specific research study going on. Um, let's see. Becky or Haley, do you want to see what you think about that? Sure, I have some ideas. Okay. So um, I think the first step would be to check out the person's website to see what they're working on in recent publications. I mean, you can look for things like topics that you might be able to connect with or also some of the tools that they're using. So um, I think it's easy to really get bogged down with um, this idea of like your research interests have to line perfectly with the person that you're applying for. Um, and oftentimes it's actually hard to get a sense of what they're actually doing, because if you think about like the publication process, it takes a long time. So when you look at their website and you're seeing these publications, this is data that they likely collected at least a year ago, maybe more depending on the type of research. So they might actually be doing different types of research. So um, when you're approaching the website, and getting information from their publications or the way that they're describing their research, try to keep it at like a big picture level because the specifics might not necessarily be what they're doing at the moment and thinking about how you can connect your broad interests to what theirs are. And then it, it might be good to ask a couple of more specific questions. Um, but you also don't want to be super, super specific where you're showing that like you don't really have a lot of flexibility in the things that you're interested in pursuing and the questions that you're able to ask, because ultimately you can have interest. Um, but once you go into somebody else's lab, they're the one that's guiding the direction and you're kind of under their wing, at least for a little bit. Um, and so. I guess um, looking for big picture connections that you can make with them is is plenty and to try not to get um, stressed out or worried about really making like super super specific things and you can also things say things like i'm interested in using this methodology that you know that the lab uses to explore what those questions are yeah and i think one thing i would add to that Haley said it super well but is also like you don't have to like I think we we had said this a few times like you don't have to be that you're not supposed to be a mirror image of your PI right like I don't know if any PI really wants you to just like come and do exactly the same thing they want you to be able to extend their work and like bring new things to the table right so like um you know you you don't want to be like I'm interested in exactly exactly what you're doing right now because that 
everyone's research interests change and likely yours will too. And likely, I mean, I feel like I pretended a little bit to some extent for what I like actually was interested in because I like I was interested in a lot of things right but it's about kind of figuring out how you can kind of say look like this is what you do this is what I am curious about and this is why your experience makes you a great fit to help me reach the goals that I have and these are the questions that I have based on the work that you're doing and the work that I'm interested in and kind of being able to kind of uh, mold those things together and kind of say, this is how I'd extend the work that you're doing rather than trying to be like exactly the perfect candidate because that person doesn't exist. And, and there's so many ways that research changes and questions change. And, and so remembering that you don't have to fit all of those boxes, I think is really helpful to kind of not feeling like there's nothing I could do to be the perfect candidate. Because that's the like Peter said earlier, like not supposed to be the PhD student yet. You're you're applying to be it. Um. I think Becky brings up a good point that I just want to add on to is about being honest about what you're interested in and who you are, because you're gonna go potentially spend five to six years in a place that you want to approach with your authentic self so that they're like, yes, this person, you know, we want you to come and be in this department. And then, so when you go in there, you're feeling like you can truly be who you are and explore the things that you're really, really interested in. Otherwise, if you're just kind of like, you know, maybe stretching the truth a little bit and what you're really, really interested in because you just want to get in the door to a PhD program, you might end up being kind of unhappy with the questions that you're answering. So it's really important to reflect on, um, could you be happy in these labs based on these broad research interests, even if they aren't fitting exactly into what you, you see yourself doing? Um, and then you want to be able to communicate that with them so that you can feel the best when you're doing this really hard thing for several years. It's a very, very good point. I There's a question in here about, um, you know, how to make your, um, so to, how to do your personal statement so it's competitive. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm talking louder because there, there are leaf blowers and weed whackers going on out there. It's like, oh, working at home. So apologies for that noise. Um, about making it competitive, but it sounds like Haley, what you're saying is that, you know, you make yourself competitive by being, coming with your authentic self and what your real interests are. Exactly. And I also think um, it can come through on the personal statement. I think you'd be surprised. Um, I think being an editor with ASFP, because I'm not really reading application statements myself at this point, just a PhD student, um, but reading them through ASFP has been really helpful. You, you kind of get a sense of who people are in their language and the way that they're talking about their experiences, and it's really cool. Um, and so trying to, trying to write the statement with that goal, um, I think is really important too. Thank you. Um, so here is a great question about um, diversity. Um, how safe is it to talk about the lack of diversity in the field um, and wanting to fill that gap? My first thought on this question is like, if that person doesn't recognize that that's a problem, then like you probably don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. So um, that being said, I wouldn't spend like your entire very short statement, like being like, everything is wrong with everything, you know, like this is just terrible, right? You want to show like, this is actively what I'm bringing. We need more of this in, in this field because we know that there's, there's, it's not just an opinion, right? There's so much evidence that like psychological science needs to grow and diversify and has been built on a foundation of, you know, whether it's research or, you know, whatever it is, like of, you know, white Western people, right? So I don't know, personally, like, I think it's really important. Um, I think that the way that you talk about it can also vary depending on how important it is to the picture you're trying to create, right? So like, you don't, I wouldn't necessarily spend a lot of time being like, it's really important for this field to diversify, but rather be like, look, these are my experiences. These experiences might be different than people that have been in this field before. And 
these are the questions I'm interested in asking, and this is why it's important for me to be here and to contribute to this um, discourse yeah. also. And that kind of shows it rather than like you saying it in that way. I like that. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, oh, um, Peter, did you want to say anything? Uh, I, I have almost no notes. That was wonderful. I, okay, okay. I, agree. Right. I, I think it's it's a combination of keeping that goal in mind. So remember, your primary goal here is, is, and this is also why in your statement, for instance, when you're describing your research, you don't want to spend a ton of time, say, describing your research in terms of the findings. I'm not reading your application statement to find out about your findings. I'm reading it to find out about you as a PhD student and what you would be like as a scientist. So you want everything to be working toward that goal. So when you are mentioning this, you want to have it working toward that goal. How does this establish who I'm going to be as a scientist and as a student? Um, and so that can help you focus it and also make it most effective. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I Becky said it brilliantly. Um, I'm just on space. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I like I sensed a like a like a reaching for the, <laughs> the mouse to unmute. Thank you. Um, so there are a few questions um, about using one primary essay for different sorts of programs um, versus sort of tailoring them. So any comments that anyone has about that? You said tailoring the, the essay Taylor, to a yeah, certain... telling your essay to different ones different. Um, and, you know, how many personal statements should you have if you're applying to multiple? So it seems like some are about um, maybe multiple schools within a certain um, sort of uh, sub-discipline or if you're, you know, maybe a counseling or a clinical um, sort of how you sort of deal with the essays and um, sort of whether there should be a primary one or, or they should be tailored. Um, I wouldn't make him too generic in case it seems, you know, then when people read too generic statements, you tend to think, oh, well, someone else is going to get them, <laughs> you know, so you kind of disengage from the application. Um, uh, I think each, you would have to tailor it somewhat. I mean, you will, you know, the most important thing is to show that there's a fit between you yeah. and the department. And so I, I, I'm not a big fan of generic statements just because then I think, oh, well, this person will be happy anywhere. So, you know, but if you want to convince me that you want to come to this place, to this university, to my lab, then there must be a little more tailoring of, um, you know, at the end of the day is really a, a fit between you and this person and how well you jive and you connect. And, you know, once it really is relationships, <laughs> you know, can you, you have a, a relationship with a person that it's going to allow you to grow, not to grow, to, you know, so, um, yeah, I would definitely make it more, more tailored to that program in that, even that lab, if you, we all are different, we all have different preferences, so. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about ways that um, it would make it easier for people to tailor their statements, because it's a lot of work to write an application statement, and, and the thought of, like, redoing it for however many schools you apply for is really daunting and no one really has the time for that and then you run into the, the fact of like will it be quality if you're just rewriting a statement 10 times or how, to however many schools you're applying to so you can reuse the facts because those are just facts so these are your research experiences um your path maybe your story and how you broadly got interested in psychology or whatever area it is but then you can kind of try to connect those two things that are more specific to the department. Um, and then the way that uh, the things that the PI in the lab that you're interested in are studying. So I would say that the, the first part of your statement will mostly be consistent across statements, but what's really gonna change is when you're talking about um, the PI and the fit. Practically speaking, the, a lot of people expect a final paragraph to be tailored. So you write most of your statement and most of it's just a base mm -hmm. statement that you just keep applying. Mm -hmm. And the final paragraph is the place where you make that change. It can be worth it to consider bigger changes than that, especially if you're applying to people who have very different emphases in their research. Can you help them see the threads that connect you to them? And that might mean that you emphasize slightly different things when you describe the same research experience, for example. Mm -hmm. But hopefully you're the same. 
in all these places. And so the whole part of your statement that's establishing who you're going to be as a scientist is kind of consistent. So that makes that the last paragraph, that's the place where you do the most uh, of this of this work, last paragraph or two, something like that. Um, uh, and for that, you really want to make sure you do a good job with that. They're paying a lot of attention to that. They know who they are, do you? And if you miss the mark on that, that can make a pretty rough impression where they say, this person doesn't actually understand what I'm doing in my lab and, and who yeah. I am. Yeah. So you do want to try to invest some time in that link and an understanding who you're applying to work with. It's also part of you know doing your homework and, and making smart applications um, for yourself. And I mean, just to add to that, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with everything. It's important to, to do both, but I have seen applications of personal statements where someone forgot to edit the common part. And instead of saying Dr. Smith, yeah. they called me Dr. Petrushka or something. And I was, I mean, I chuckled, but it was like, okay, well, you got to get that Petrushka because my name is not that. So, you know, that happened to me too. So it, be very careful. Just edit edit the thing look for so that, that it doesn't look like you just copy and paste it from someone else it's, it's not the deal breaker for me but it does show a little sloppiness so yeah yeah oh wonderful and maybe um i'll just sneak one more in here um before um we end today um and it's a question that came in about sort of how to talk about um sort of research and research topic, which I think you answered, but it came from someone who identified as an international student. Um, and so it made me wonder if you had any sort of thoughts um, about uh, considerations for international students. About anything? Any, about anything? any aspect? Yes, of, any, anything? Yeah, oh. any, yeah, anyone who's sort of international well. applying that they should Sort of be thinking about or uh, other than sort of all the wonderful things that uh, that we've talked about today i love international students i think it's so great to have people from other countries and other cultures and so you know yeah tell us who you are and why you want to come here the same things i mean but uh i i, I welcome diversity a lot because that's how i grow my tree i think if we don't have diversity you just don't grow don't go up much it's much slower so um, having a different lens to see my the same things that I see, I think it's such a privilege. So, totally, it's an asset. So please apply. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think international applicants are fantastic. I do think that it's really important to do your homework and really know like what what programs the United States are asking for or in wherever you're applying to, um, because I know that the, you know, that's a whole nother hurdle, right? To be able to understand like how your experience might fit with the different countries' expectations. And it's not something that you can't like bridge. It is something that you should know about though, right? So making sure that you have a sense of like, whether you need, like in some countries, maybe you need a master's to apply to a PhD program. You don't have to do that in the US or like um, what types of experiences, all of these experiences you have are probably really, really relevant, but knowing how to like, make them applicable, I think, is something that comes with like doing a little bit more work in the front end of trying to figure out kind of what it is programs are looking for and the expectations um, there. Right. Thank you. I can't believe an hour is gone, but it is. Um, I want to thank you all so much for um, participating today um, and for all your great insights and guidance uh, for the listeners. Um, and um, it's been wonderful. Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, so I am going to turn this uh, back over to Shandel to close us out. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed hearing from our panelists. We'll be sending you a one minute survey after this broadcast. We value your feedback. So let us know how we're doing. Feel free to share topics you'd like to for us to cover in the future, you can email us at science at apa.org with your recommendations. Much thanks to Peter, Becky, Haley, uh, and Natasha for sharing their insights and expertise. We hope that you'll join us for other sessions in the series. Stay tuned for further information in the coming days. Uh, we encourage you to consider subscribing to Science Spotlight your source for the most relevant news and information for psychological scientists by psychological scientists. And we'll post information about upcoming sessions uh, in the series in Science Spotlight. So please subscribe today. 
Um, thanks again, and we look forward to the rest of the series. Have a great day.